writer and director, Lance Hammer. Thank you very much for joining us here. At Thank WKCR. you. Thank you. Um, you know, usually I start out uh, an interview um, concerning a film. I ask the director to just give me a little synopsis of the plot line, but I'm not going to do that here because Thank you. I feel like a synopsis of the plot line isn't really what's important and what's relevant to this film. Um, rather, let's talk more about the mood that you're trying to convey through this film. What, 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 what were you thinking in terms of the, the feelings, the mood, the color when you wanted to portray it in this film? Yeah, you know, it's really kind of a simple thing. It, it, it had to do with my first visit to the Delta and, and feeling um, an overwhelming sense of sorrow and at the same time feeling a tremendous kind of sense of existential beauty, you know, like the, the kind of beauty, beauty that only happens when you're, you're really experiencing something very sorrowful. And this is the, the sort of thing that is not articulable. It's not uh, novelists, well, talented novelists can perhaps articulate this in poets. Um, but for me, it was something that I, I, was, I was challenged at that moment to try to make a film that conveyed this sense of sorrow I was feeling and and at the same time the sense of beauty that I was feeling, which was largely about the landscape and particularly the delta in the winter time and um, it had to do with the sound of a place too. So film seemed like a natural medium to try to express this thing, communicate this thing with as truthfully as possible, as accurately as possible um, without the need to actually use words mm -hmm. and um that 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 was the the beginning of the project that was i had no idea of a narrative structure i, I actually didn't was had little interest in the narrative structure it was i my interest remained till the end um a desire to communicate a tonal phenomenon and and uh the narrative would have to serve that instead of the other way around so you know because you did mention sound oh, mm -hmm. which is such a huge part of this film um mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about that for a second. There's no music really. There's one song mm -hmm. uh, that plays on the radio, um, but really there's no soundtrack for this film. Um, only only the ambient noise. Mm -hmm. um, why why first of all? Well, I, I think it it has to do with what I was just discussing that um, my experience of that place, that initial experience, and then subsequently every experience I had in the place afterwards or through this ten year period. Um, was so dependent on on the particular type of sound in the delta, which is in the winter it's silent, and um, in the summer it's full. It's a cacophony of insect noise, and um, but in the winter, it, it, you know, it's kind of like being on the moon. And um, but the more you listen to that silence, the more the more I actually studied it, and I, I would go and record it. I discovered how complicated it actually is. It's full of noise, it's, but it's just very muted, and it's. Um, it, natural like you hear the the snow geese you know constantly in the distance in the skies or in a field several miles away and the distant hum of a highway you know reverberating off of a a forest of hardwoods and um very particular sound that had was 50 percent or more of my experience and i realized that to include music would would contaminate that silence and contaminate therefore the experience so you know my primary interest like i said was to accurately and truthfully convey the experience at, of this place and music would just intrude on it um i'm also um i'm not fond of films that use music to manipulate emotion and i'm of the belief that if if a scene can't work emotionally without music it should not be part of the film and it's too often used as a crutch so um you know to to manipulate and I didn't want to do that, so it was it was kind of a gauge for me. Without being able to use music, I'd have to look at a scene that I was cutting, and say, "Is it worthy of staying in the film? Can it exist on its own?" And if it's not, I have to cut it out of the film. And there's plenty of those. <laughs> so, so now, if you're if you're anything like me, um, often you'll have music playing in your head, even when there is no music. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, now, if I'm a musician, like music is incredibly important to me, and and. I, and it was always a tremendous temptation to put it in, but I had to stay true. I actually recorded a score for it myself, for really? a, a partial score, just for the hell of it. Huh. 
it just it, it didn't have a place in the end. So I guess that kind of uh, morphs into my next question. So mm-hmm. what did that score really? What was what was it? It was very sparse piano notes, uh-huh. and um, there was a um, a cor anglais as well. Um, do you kind of hear that music when you watch the film, or do you just really is is the is the ambient noise in of itself the music? There was a moment when I was when I became serious about actually putting music in, and that was actually because I chickened out. You know, my intention from the beginning was to be you know very Spartan and and rigid in, in this belief that you cannot put music in, and then I I lost my confidence and said, I have to put music in. And what am I thinking? Um, so for most of the period, I was not thinking of music at all because it just wasn't allowed. And then I s- started to play some, and I, and I started thinking about it musically. And it's funny because it really affected the way I started cutting. I started recutting the film with a lot of drifting landscape shots and things that, you know, complemented this this languid, you know, minimalist piano score. Um, and then at the end, I cut that all out again. You know, I... Um, it really does affect the way you cut a film. Mm. And it radically affects the emotion of a film. It's, it's a very powerful tool. You know, if someone like Jean-Luc Godard in, in, like, in Praise of Love and Notre Musique, um, Charles Burnett in, in Killer of Sheep used music in this masterful way. I think Paul Thomas Anderson uses it in a pretty masterful way sometimes, with, and he uses tremendous amounts of it too. Um, these are... There, it's it's a difficult thing to use music effectively in a film, and I'm not sure if I actually know how to do it. To be honest, it's a skill that I have to develop, if, you know. But I didn't have time in this project either, so. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of this project. Mm-hmm. Um, let's just begin with that. how did it come about. It, it was it was that day. You know, I, I was in. Memphis, um, and I was writing another project, and I thought, um, since I was in Memphis, just kind of roaming with in a car, um, I decided to go see the Delta, and I hadn't seen it before, so I wasn't. I was just interested in seeing something. I wasn't interested in making a project, um, but that feeling happened. I was unprepared for this. Uh, this feeling of you know, that's beauty and a sadness feeling. Um, and it, it is, you know, every once in a while those things happen where something speaks to you very strongly and you just kind of know what you're going to be doing for the next several years of your life. And that's what happened. Uh, and then, so then I started coming back. I wasn't, you know, an art director on studio film, so that's a kind of gypsy life. You you work for, you know, six to 18 months on a project, then you're off and you, uh, and then you try to find your next gig and do it again. And so, you always have these one month, two months off between projects, and I, I always take those opportunities to drive somewhere and just get in my car and start driving and and write. And uh, it was in the midst of one of those little meanderings that this happened. And then then I kept I kept doing that, and the more I found myself picking my art directing jobs very carefully, so that I would I would have more time to to go to Mississippi and. Um, I researched it extensively, you know, academically, everything I could get my hands on. I, I would get in cars with people that live there and just tour the Delta with them, you know, visit the place where their parents are buried, you know, it just the generosity of spirit out there is really intense. And I, I learned about this place. And the more I learned, what I learned was that I had very little authority to speak of anything with specificity, you know. Um, I'm an outsider, and I always will be, no matter how much I know. And it really informed the way I approached the project, you know, from a place of detachment and and uh, with a, a need to have the people that I cast contribute their own language and, and themselves to the role. Like I depended upon them to to own the film, you know. Um, I sort of lost track of what the question was at this point. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay because it leads me into, into another question, mm-hmm. which is uh, the cast. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me about the casting process. Yeah, you know, the original concept was to try to convey something very accurately, a sense of place with accuracy. And that logically extended to when I started thinking about scenario and narrative structure, um, 
I therefore started thinking of human beings that would be populating these the spaces. And it was always clear to me that I had to find people that actually lived in the particular places I was going to be shooting in. And the language had to come from them. The idiom is so important. And not only that, like the, you know, the idiom, the idiom of a region, but uh, everybody's individual personal idiom was important. And um, I thought that because I am an outsider, the the authenticity factor would only be able to be contributed by the people that live in this place. And, and you would see it in their physical comportment. You would see it in their choice of words, uh, the way a white character interacts with the black character, you know, without my d- direction. It's just something that comes with the region. And and I, I, so I knew I had to go find people that had never acted before. And not only that, go to the particular places I'm going to shoot in and find them there. So, um, you know, I went to churches. I, I um, it was the first, the first thing I did was went to the Baptist churches that are, you know, the patriarchal centers of each of these small towns and described, you know, talked about the project with them to see if they had, if they would be supportive. And if they weren't, I had to really seriously question what I was doing. If I, if the project was worth being made and it turns out that they were very supportive and, um, opened their doors to me, literally, like I I came to the services and they would make an an announcement in the announcement section of a service and say somebody's here making a film about our town you know and wants to use all of you folks anybody that's interested in being in the film you know come talk to to him he's he's here you know we'll have lunch with him and i lawrence who michael smith who plays lawrence he's the son of one of those preachers for example you know went to boys and girls clubs had open casting calls saw people on the sidewalks, you know. I, I, I really was interested in somebody's physical demeanor, and that's the way I cast the film, like by the way they moved in space and kind of my energetic reading with them. And, and then later we would audition, and the auditions consisted of, they were the first step of our workshopping rehearsal process um, where we discovered the language of the film. And it was like three months of that. But the audition, I, I you know, I... I'd narrow it down to a couple people for each role and throw them me- immediately into the fire and say, okay, here's a scene. Here's what we're going to do. What would you do? What would you say? Let's try it. And you could immediately see what people could inherently role play like that and do it in such a way that they're using their own language, you know, and not acting. Um, so that was my involvement as a director was choosing. And then once the choices were made, I had very little to do. You know, it truly became owned by the actors at that point. How much of the script were they following, and how did that work? Well, they were following the script, but it was all, you know, orally described. It was almost in the oral tradition. Like uh-huh. we would, and that's a very that's a very important part of the Mississippi. Actually, is the oral storytelling tradition. Um, we would talk about it together. Um, we would go to the locations because we had them already. You know, I wrote them. I, I wrote the script based, based upon finding locations, and then they inspired the the writing process actually. And we talk about a scene and say, "Here's what's happening. What what would you do here? Like, here's what I'm thinking the scene should do." And most, you know, seventy percent of the film is exactly the way I wrote it. Um, I mean, not the language so much, but the the dynamics of a scene. And then thirty percent is completely improvised by either the actors or by Law Crawley, who's the cinematographer, or by me. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, we mostly followed the structure, but the language was very, very different than what I wrote. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm definitely going to get to Law Crawley and the beautiful mm-hmm. cinematography in a mm-hmm. second, but just before I do, um, the all the lighting is natural lighting, and mm-hmm. all the locations are found real locations. Right. And you mentioned that the locations actually influenced the story itself. Can you... Yeah. Can you elaborate well, on that? Well, like one one of the most obvious examples is um, the relationship between those two tenant houses where uh, the brothers live and the um, the manor house, you know, the across the, which is like a you know eighteen hundreds Mississippi plantation house. Th- that's a common you know architectural arrangement there, um, and it, it speaks a lot. It, it's pure geographical architectural configuration says so much about the history of race you know in this place the racial relationships the 
it goes back to slavery. And um, I would see that all of the time, you know, all over the place. You'd see all the tenant houses and the relationship of the tenant houses to the to the manor house and the plantation house. And it just uh, you basically need to turn a camera on and do nothing else film that situation and it's speaking volumes about a history in a place so it informed my writing process as well um you know the 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 obvious thing was the landscapes which i would find a particular place near a river you know these fields in a particular configuration would make me think of these say okay it would inspire ideas you know i think every every almost everything in the script came from looking at the landscape and then having some sort of thought about scenario that could occur within that landscape. Um, or photographing exhaustively, bringing it back to Los Angeles and just studying it at en- you know, endlessly and then thinking first visually and then you know, narratively. Um, the store, I already knew the store. You know, we picked it out. We, um, there's just almost everything in that that is in the film has, was chosen first, and then I wrote about it afterwards. How about the um, the house where the young hoodlums live and sell crack? Things? That's that's one we found later. Um, that was you know a troubling place. <laughs> um, it's kind of the real thing, you know. Is it? Uh, yeah, I, I can, there's only so much I can say about 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 it, but it's you know fairly authentic, we'll say. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. I guess I guess we'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's best. Um, okay. Um, so then then let's move on to the to the question that I mentioned before. Mm. Um ab- about about uh the natural light, uh the cinematography. Uh of course Lil Crawley won best cinematographer um mm. at Sundance for this, yeah. this this beautiful, beautiful use of natural light and tell me a little bit about what it was like working with him the process, um, because I can only imagine it must have been so tight and you must have been looking over his shoulder mm. at every moment. Can you just tell me a bit about it? Yeah, that's that's the way it was. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't met him before, and I offered him a job over the phone having seen a, a short film that he'd done. And, you know, we, we talked about it extensively on the phone. He's in Newcastle, England. So I didn't have the, the money to fly him out and do the interview process, you know. So flew him out to – I said, you have the job if you want it. He He did. Met him in the Jackson Airport, and we got in a car, and and then you know traveled. Basically, we just traveled all around the Delta together, and went to all the locations. Um, and by a pure stroke of luck, it just so happens that he and I are have kind of a, an attunement um, aesthetically, and you know, you know, in so many ways. Like Law, Law became su- such a collaborator and so intimately involved in my process that. I wasn't really prepared for it, you know. Um, in the end, we had a lot of difficulty in production with the crew, um, not the cast. You know, the cast was, were beautiful and so passionate and committed, and Law was this way as well, and just absolutely a fire in his spirit to make this film and w- without compromise. And and that's the way I was, you know. And so. He was like a producer, you know. He, we, there's just such a breakdown of the delineation between roles. There was there was no such thing, you know. We we were all he was working with actors too. I mean, we were just intimately involved in every aspect. So literally, it got to the point where I mean, I storyboarded, for example, the whole film or most of it, and we sat down together at first and we're going over storyboards and you know, okay, to be safe, you know. I, I didn't know what my relationship was going to be with him. And in the end, you know, we shot the first day of photography from the boards, and I realized we don't need these, you know. And and he and I were both thinking that. And the second day, we just said, let's be brave. Let's just throw them away and respond intuitively to everything. And so we tried it on the second day, and it just worked. And, um, you know, he, he basically at, at that point was seeing exactly the way I was seeing. So I could completely entrust him to respond to a scene because you know he was like he was like an actor he was operating the camera it's all handheld our approach was using long master shots these long roving master shots throughout space that i would later dissect and cut into a million pieces to to compose the film but um 
it, it, re- it really was an athletic, intuitive exercise on his part to respond to a certain person speaking at a certain time, the way he moved through space with the actors. And, you know, there'd be times when I'd push him around. I, I re- really was behind him a lot of the time. And, and I would, you know, we, we had this, this comes from Lars von Trier and, and um, who was it who shot Breaking the Waves? It was Mueller. Um, anyway, you know, Lars would trip him up on purpose just to destroy the image, you know, in a healthy way. And we, we practiced some of that just to make ourselves think on our feet. But, um, yeah, Lal is, Lal is, um, I was very happy he won that award because he deserved it. And, uh, sure worked for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so much of the film is these handheld shots just following around the characters, as you mentioned. Um, it's, it's almost hard for me to imagine like you, as you mentioned, you worked in Hollywood. It's hard for me to imagine that behind the camera, there's crew and catering tables and stuff like that. How 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 big was this production? Tell me a little mm-hmm. bit about what I would see if there was a behind the scenes. Well, there was a very small crew. You know, it was it was important. I had you know I came from that system where you you do a lighting change and it's an hour, two hours to to and, and, you know you have a set, the the, con, the common shot counter shot you know, kind of technique that's used by Hollywood re- is ancient. And it, it's about shooting one direction on one actor, taking all the lights, moving them to the other side, switching the camera, an hour and a half later, shooting the reverse shots. And it's just look so painfully slow that it kills anything. Any, any life that you can find in, in a film is just destroyed. So I, I knew from the beginning that we were going to not use lights. We were going to have a handheld camera so we could have immediacy. And our crew was going to be very small because, you know, it's like a Hollywood production has this very long tail, and it takes it takes an hour for the, the end of the tail to sweep around, you know. And if you want to have spontaneity and be able to respond to something happening in the landscape it, instantaneously, you have to have a very short tail that can swing around very quickly. And that's the crew, you know. That's the catering table. That's the big trucks you have to move. And so we just, you know, I, I, as it was, I hired too many people. I mean, I think it was, you know, at any given time on the set, we had 15 people or something. But a lot of that time, they weren't doing anything because there was no lights, you know. And I was just, and I found that it was very frustrating to deal with a crew. Uh, we, w- In the end, w- the dynamic that was working was the actors, Law, his first and second AC, and Sam Watson, who was our sound recordist and uh we operated like a just a very tight little unit that could like a documentary crew Mm. yeah Um, i mean definitely has that documentary feel yeah and next time i would do it with a much smaller crew you know eight people max wow yeah um let's maybe if, if we don't go so much into the story let's at least talk about how the story came about the narrative. You, you mentioned um, you were driving around the Mississippi Delta. Uh, you wanted to convey the place, um, but of course, there has to be more. There has to be characters. There has to be narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, how did how did the story come about? Well, it took me a long time to figure that out. I mean, to make that first step, you know, into making it, to taking it out of the realm of the completely theoretical into something approach, you know, in, that moves in the direction of the physical, you know, the, something that can be actually manifested. Um, and I, I think what it honestly was, was I was, I'd been writing a couple things that eventually I, I, I cannibalized them and made them, brought them together into this, what ultimately would be this story. But I was interested in this idea of identical twins. And um, my, my mother's an identical twin. And losing a twin, um, particularly particularly to suicide, um, because there's such a, a psychic connection between, such a psychic bond between an identical twin. That kind of loss, that kind of grief, is unmatched. You know, like the, and it's hard to dis, it's hard to know that feeling unless you, you either are an identical twin or you're very you know, close to one. And so I was looking. You know, I realized grief was the subject that would was one one subject that had an, a natural relationship to the feeling I felt in the Delta. So I thought, I, this is going to be a story about grieving. I know that. And uh, my girlfriend told me a story of 
um, a friend that is an identical twin, and he was walking up the stairs to his apartment one day and then opened the door, found the window was open, and looked outside, and his brother had jumped and killed himself without an, an explanation, you know, no prior indication of desire to commit suicide. So the survivor of guilt issue was immense, you know, and, and, and he never, the kind of his complicity in that event, he never could figure out. And so I, I thought that was a compelling, that, that could really drive a story, you know, like a search to figure out what, what had happened, what was, your, what was his role in that, the undoing of his, you know, his twin. And um, I think, yeah, so that was the genesis. I thought, and then I don't know, it just over, it took me a long time to write it, two years. It's a very simple story. I don't know why it took so long. Um, and it seemed, you know, I started writing a story actually about the twins without thinking it was going to be in the Delta. It was actually white characters and, you know, they were older men. And then at one point the light bulb just kind of went off and I realized, oh, well, this is the Delta story, you know. It's grief, loss, dealing with loss. Um, this is the Delta story. So I got to work. Hmm. You know, um, you mentioned before that uh, when these characters, people, you know, um, they're almost, they're really the same thing. Um, mm. When they're black, when they deal with white people, mm -hmm. there's almost a, a different way of talking mm -hmm. and a different way of relating. Mm -hmm. um, how did how did that come about with you? You are white for the sake of radio. Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, your actors are black. Was there any sort of different way that they related to you than to each other? Oh, yeah, of course. It's It's something that, it, it, you know, it's it, it's the history of of a place. It's like everything that, you know, it's this everything that my white ancestors did, you know, in that place. The brutality. It's just, you know, it's just the way it is. But the the one thing that happened was, you know, there was a, a level of caution at first. They there was an interest in the project. I I, I ended up becoming over a long period of time very close to the actors and in a very long period of time they begin to trust me you know and understand that um this was something i was very passionate about and i and i had a genuine interest in their towns you know um in their lives and i really wanted their personal experiences to be expressed by them and it, it was a very valuable thing to me um and we became pretty close, you know. We we became pretty close. So, but there's there's always there's always uh, uh, I can never maybe this isn't even about race, but I'm an outsider to a place, you know. It's a culture that in the in the South um, I'm not part of, and I, I never completely can understand. So this is a decidedly you know the film has a decidedly detached tone. You know, the POV is is observant. It's not. Um, participatory. You know, the camera is never the POV of, of a character, for example. It's always watching a character, watching something. So it, it's, I think, you know, I did that on purpose. It's a, I'm trying to say I'm, I'm an alien watching a culture, and I'm trying to understand it and have a great interest in it. But, you know, and that's why it was so important for me not to direct the actors as much as possible, but to let the actors direct themselves. And I would record it, you know. I just accepted I'm an outsider, and that's the way it is. This is the way the film has to be. So, the the, the ironic thing, though, is you know over time we did gain a, a trust, and you know I think they, I trusted them, they trusted me, and together we did something that I think we were both proud of. We were all proud of. Um, you know, as you mentioned, when you were doing these quote unquote castings in mm -hmm. the churches, the people would say. This man wants to make a story about our town, about mm -hmm. us. Uh, would anyone like to help him out? Um, who ultimately is the audience for this film? Who do you really want to watch it and want mm -hmm. it to influence? I don't know. I, I mean, it's important to me <clears throat> that the film is shown in the South. You know, I, I think that's an important thing. Um, I honestly... When I make the film, I have I'm not thinking of an audience. You know, I'm a, it's funny. I, it, I'm I'm a believer that a, any artist should think only of themselves, and it's art is a very selfish pursuit. 
It should be. It has to be if you want to have something very a personal and pure voice. Um, you can only think of what you know, and that's yourself. And the beautiful, magical irony is that if you do that in a way that is genuine and, and you're saying something that's truly meaningful to you, it, and it, it can resonate with other people as well. And um, so I wasn't thinking of an audience. I was only thinking of myself in a very selfish way when I was making this, the film. And I was stubborn about that, you know. And I think also if you start thinking about an audience and like who might be buying tickets, you kill, you kill the art form. And you just have to be courageous and make, a, make a, any piece of art without thinking about the commercial potential. Well, you know, sorry. So I, still, I don't know who the audience is. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the reviews, though, have, of course, been rave. And mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have been saying that this is, you know, like uh, an extremely true piece of Southern black Americana. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's 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 very true to the place. Um, can you um, tell me about like why 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 might it be that that this is this film about this small people you know three people uh, is is a film that so many have found to ring the truest more than a film that you know tells an entire history. Well, if if people are perceiving the film as being a, a piece of true African American Americana, I, I can't claim credit for that because I am white and I I I know the region very well, but I can't I'm not the one contributing that. That's coming from the actors, you know. Honestly, the the um, my reverence of the place and my, you know, for my love of the the imagery, you know, of the landscape, the love of the people, you know, the the the, re the relationship visually of a human being in that landscape. Um, that's and Law's Law's uh, appreciation of that and his phot photographic skills. I th I think, you know, he and I both fell in love with the place and, and, and had great reverence for it. So I think that probably might be coming through. I don't know. Um, and, and probably the, the thing, if people are, are, res are responding to it in that way, you know, I, I didn't try to talk about race or a place in, in that way. I tried to talk about these very universal things. The one thing that I, I could speak about was, you know, grief. I could speak about endurance. I could speak about the the nature of people the strange and idiotic nature of people to be hopeful in, in, in the face of tremendous suffering and the beauty in that and the dignity in that. And these are things that transcend race. So, you know, and honestly, they were the, when I was writing, these were the things I was feeling. I, I mean, I was suffering from a tremendous bout of depression at that time. And, you know, maybe that's coming through truthfully because it, it still exists from the script that I wrote. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I don't know why people respond to the film. To be honest, I, I don't get it. I, you know, it's hard for me to know what people are thinking when they watch the film and why they say certain things about it, or good or bad. You know, because there's a lot of people that hate it. You know, um, and I don't understand that either. You know, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm very much in the in the dark and I'm, I'm basically blind. You know, and I, I think it's important to actually remain that way. If I start feeling like I get it, um, I think I'll end up making bad work. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, the film spoke to me uh, on some level, and I definitely enjoyed it. Um, so thank you for making well, it. And you. Lance Hammer, thanks for joining us in the studio today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.